Welcome to the launch of the IEA's Africa Energy Outlook. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Maria van der Hoven is Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. Fatih Birol is Chief Economist of the International Energy Agency. He designed and directed this report. Maria and Fatih will present the report and its findings, and afterwards we will turn it, up, uh, turn it over to your questions. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Greg. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us today at the global launch of the International Energy Agency's Africa Energy Outlook. That's it. Special report in the 214 World Energy Outlook series. This is the most comprehensive study of the sub-Saharan energy sector that the IEA has ever undertaken, and it is the product of invaluable cooperation with many African governments, African institutions, and African companies. There are too many to name individually, but suffice to say, without their excellent engagement, this work could not have been completed. While we are launching the special report today, the global launch of the IEA's full updated World Energy Out 2014 will take place here in London on November 12th, and you, I hope you will be able to join us in November as well. However, today the spotlight is on Africa, and specifically on Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is because a, a major crisis continues within our global energy system, is an energy poverty crisis. And the epicenter of this crisis is Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the World Energy Outlook has pioneered the, the need to tackle energy poverty for more than a decade. And it's an issue I have engaged with personally as a member of the advisory board of the UN Secretary General Sustainable Energy for All Initiative. More than 620 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's around two-thirds of the total population, live without electricity. And only one country in the region, South Africa, consumes even as much electricity as London. And on average, each of us, each of us in this room, consumes more electricity than 16 people in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in addition, nearly 730 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa still rely on hazardous, inefficient forms of cooking, using wood, charcoal, dung, or agricultural residues as fuel in polluting cooking stoves and causing huge numbers of premature deaths each year. And today, the use of traditional fuels such as these easily outweighs the use of all our other fuels combined. Now, put simply, the energy sector of Sub-Saharan Africa is not yet able to meet the needs and aspirations of its citizens. More can be done to tackle this. More should be done to tackle this. And importantly, the benefits of tackling this outweighs the costs, meaning that it also makes economic sense. The primary purpose of our energy system is to enable economic growth and a better quality of life. And for those who have it, modern energy access, modern energy unlocks access to better healthcare, better education, better eco economic opportunities, and even to longer life. And you can imagine, when we look at today's Ebola crisis, although in this report it's not about Ebola crisis, but having energy that brings better, multiple benefits also for healthcare is a huge and important issue to have. For those who don't have it, it's a major constraint on their social and economic development, but the challenge is surmountable and the benefits of success are multiple and immense. The Africa Energy Outlook finds that Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub Africa's existing energy resources are more than sufficient to meet the needs of the population, but that they are unevenly distributed and underdeveloped. And that's a fact that speaks strongly towards the benefits of regional energy cooperation. And Sub-Saharan Africa is already home to several major energy producers, including Nigeria, South Africa, and Angola. And these are being joined by emerging producers, including Mozambique and Tanzania. Such countries are in a position to reap an economic dividend from their natural resources. But the report highlights the need to reinvest this dividend locally to yield yet greater gains, both in terms of a more effective, capable energy sector and in terms of much more broad-based economic growth. That's what we need. And in general, African countries are endowed with abundant renewable energy resources, which they are expected to harness increasingly. 
By 2040, renewables are expected to account for nearly 45% of all power generation capacity in the region. Varying in scale, yes, from large hydropower dams to mini and off-grid solutions in more remote areas. In the report Central Outlook to 2040, the sub-Saharan economy gradually releases the energy break. The economy quadruples in size and energy demand grows by 80%, but per capita energy consumption remains very low. And the outlook for providing access to electricity, dear friends, is bittersweet. Nearly 1 billion people are expected to gain access to electricity by 2040. But because of very rapid population growth in the region, more than half of a billion are still expected to be without electricity at that time. So what can be done? What more can be done? The Africa Energy Outlook finds that increasing access to reliable modern energy can turbocharge economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa, enabling a major push towards this more self-sustaining model of economic growth. And the report identifies key actions in the energy sector that could provide both a strong boost to the sub-Saharan economy and put it on a much faster path to a modern integrated energy system for all. And implementation of these actions will require something. It will require high-level political commitment to energy sector reform. And policy makers need to focus on building human capacity within the energy sector, strengthening policy and regulatory frameworks so that well-functioning energy markets emerge, opening up energy markets to new players and to new sources of finance, and where it's not already the case, moving towards pricing that reflects market fundamentals. They also need to build on existing channels of regional cooperation, which can bring about mutual benefits. And perhaps most importantly, actions must be taken to integrate high standards of governance, both within and beyond the energy sector. And transparency and accountability are critical to building credibility and public trust. So a long-term development model for the region needs to be one where the energy sector becomes a, a driver rather than an inhibitor of growth. And for those of us fortunate enough to have access to modern energy, we must recognize that every single advanced economy has required secure access to modern energy to underpin its growing prosperity. And for those without modern energy, the energy sector cannot grow quickly enough. They are impatient for progress. Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to account for 20% of the global population in 2040, meaning that the energy choices made in the region will also have global consequences. And finally, I would once again like to express my thanks to the many African governments, institutions and experts across all aspects of sub-Saharan energy sector that we have been privileged to work with on this report. These are, my in, these are my introducing comments, and I will now turn the floor over to our chief economist, Fatih Biro, who directed the report, and he will, prevent, he will present the detailed findings.